We're very excited to bring you this interactive online experience that will let you learn more about what it's like to be a student at SCNM and then what it's like to be out in the field practicing as a naturopathic doctor. My name is Eve Velotis and I will be your host for today's webinar. During this webinar, you'll be hearing from Dr. Kristen Bishop, an SCNM alumna, and Alexandra Mayer, a third year SCNM student. First, we'll hear from Alexandra, or Alex. Alex grew up in Ancaster, Ontario, Canada. She began her journey to naturopathic medicine during her undergraduate degree in health sciences at the University of Western Ontario. At this time, she really found her passion for medicine and started researching various careers in healthcare to find the one that was the best fit. That was when she discovered natural, naturopathic medicine, began seeing an ND herself, and knew that this was the path she was meant to take. Her journey led her here to SCNM in Arizona, where she's currently a third year medical student. When she's not studying, Alex is involved with the local and national board of the NMSA, which is the National Medical Student Association. In her free time, she loves to hike the beautiful mountains here in sunny Arizona. Then uh, after uh, we hear from Alex, we'll hear from Dr. Kristen Bishop. Dr. Bishop is a naturopathic medical doctor specializing in family practice here in Mesa, Arizona. She has been in holistic healthcare since 2001 as a doula and wellness coordinator at a family chiropractic practice in Florida. As a licensed family practitioner, she can prescribe pharmaceuticals when needed, but chooses to do so as a last resort and focuses instead on treating the cause of disease using botanical medicine, homeopathy, acupuncture, nutrition, spinal adjustments, or hydrotherapy, some of those modalities that I mentioned that NDs use. Dr. Bishop holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Bowling Green State University in Ohio, and again, she earned her medical degree here from SCNM. Dr. Bishop, uh, in addition to having a busy and thriving practice, is the mother of four children and has been married for 16 years. When she's not working, she enjoys traveling, exercising, and spending time with her family. So thank you again for joining us for this webinar. We hope you'll find this presentation both interesting and informative. And with that, let me turn it over to Alex to begin our presentation. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Alex, and this is going to be the student portion of the presentation. Um, so just a quick introduction, you did a good job, um, but I am a current student at SCNM and I'm in my third year. So um, I'm currently in quarter 10 and I started here at SCNM in January of 2011, which makes me a winter start. Um, and I actually love being a winter start. I wouldn't have changed that for the world. And I moved here from Canada. So I get asked a lot why I moved so far away from home and why I didn't choose to go to the school in Toronto. Um, to be honest, I looked at other schools and Toronto was actually the school that I had my heart set on when I first started applying. But after I applied here, I came for my interview and I realized that it was just a much better fit for me. Um, the school has a great atmosphere, they have great people, and they have a really a sense of cohesion within the student body. And I realized that for me personally, I need that supportive atmosphere. And I knew from the minute I did my interview here that SCNM was going to provide me with that. I also chose SCNM because the weather is a fantastic plus. And although it gets hot, it's way better than the snow. So, um, so a typical day in my life looks, well, basically like coming to school most of the day. <laughs> um, this is my schedule currently. And what you can see is that the days really range. They vary in what time I start and what time I end. And while some days are short, other days are really long. So it just depends on what your schedule looks like that, that quarter. And what I've also learned with being in school is that there are differences in how difficult the quarters are and kind of how busy you feel. Um, like, for example, quarter nine for me seemed 
super easy and it was very laid back. And then we got to quarter 10 and things definitely took a change. And this quarter is much busier. So you do get breaks where it feels like a lot less, but then they, there are quarters that it feels like more. Um, so school for me right now is basically just doing a bunch of didactic classes, my clinical shifts, and some off-site observations. So I have chosen to um, shadow some doctors kind of out in the community to see what practicing life really looks like. And that's been really beneficial for me. And then work and fun. And yes, I do have fun. It's very important. So you know, as much as medical school seems like it should be your main priority, keeping yourself healthy is also really important. So the classes, um, I just kind of broke it down by year here. So your first year is mostly your basic sciences. So you're going to be taking a human biology class, um, and that really takes up most of your time in first year. That's going to be your anatomy, your physiology, your embryology, everything you could think of in that um, department. This is mixed with um, a naturopathic philosophy class and then your clinical practice class. What's nice about the clinical practice class is that it really gets you kind of starting to feel like a doctor from day one. So day, week one, you start taking vitals and then you start doing patient intakes and things like that. So it kind of keeps you motivated when, you're, when you have your head stuck in basic science books and um, kind of keeps your eye on the end goal. In second year, you start your pathology class and then the start of your modalities. So nutrition, um, homeopathy, physical medicine, all of those things you start in your second year. Um, and then either first or second summer, depending on when you start. So if you're a September start, it will be your first summer. And if, it's, if you're a winter start, it would be your second summer. You do clinical observations. So. Um, they put you out in com the community with a doctor, and you have to do, I think it's 60 hours of shadowing with a doctor. And this was honestly one of the most beneficial experiences I've had at SCNM. Um, the doctor that I shadowed did women's medicine, and she is actually um, a midwife in the area. And she was fantastic. She taught me so much. I felt like I learned a lot, and I'm actually still in contact with her today, and I still plan on shadowing her more in the future because that's how beneficial it has been for me. Um, so now third year, where I am right now, you have classes, and it's mixed with clinicians. Um, so in quarter 10, I am currently finishing up my very last class of Chinese medicine. Um, I'm finishing up my last class of homeopathy and nutrition. And then we're also taking a lot of the ology classes. But it's different than the basic sciences because it's looking at more treatments of disease and it includes the naturopathic treatments of disease. So um, this quarter, for example, I have cardiology, um, and then pulmonology, and last quarter we have minor surgery. So there's just a bunch of different different courses that you're taking in third year. Um, so for clinic shifts, clinic shifts start in quarter eight, and it starts with two clinic shifts. And basically the way it works is it kind of titrates up throughout your your career here. So you have two clinic shifts in quarter eight and nine, and then you have three clinic shifts in quarter ten. And then you have five until you graduate. So that would be five clinic shifts in quarter 11, 12, 13, and 14. Um, this quarter, I have Dr. Mitchell at Educare. And she is a pediatric naturopathic doctor. And Educare is actually one of our off-sites. So it's run through the Scottsdale Healthcare Hospital. And it's been a really fantastic experience. And then I have Dr. Turner and Dr. Dye, both of who are really awesome. Dr. Turner does women's medicine, which is actually the area I'm most interested in. And then Dr. Dye does a lot of endocrinology and mind body. So what's nice about clinic shifts is that you're kind of getting that hands-on experience and you're really being able to put things together um, through your learning so that it's kind of all coming together from over the years and being put into a way that you can better understand it. Um, and then you have patient write-ups in clinic a lot. And the best thing about patient write-ups is that you really get to learn 
on your own. So you would have a patient come into the clinic, and then usually the week between that shift and the next shift, the entire um, shift writes up the patient. So you read through the chart notes, and you come up with what you think your top differentials are for diagnoses, what you would actually diagnose her with, what labs you would want to run, um, what you would want to do for your treatment. And it's really great because it gets you using your own brain, but in a kind of nice controlled environment where you can go and talk it through with the rest of your shift and get some feedback on it. Um, so it really just helps with the learning. Um, so finally, I did want to put in a slide about what we do for fun here. Because like I said earlier, fun is incredibly important. And in medical school, it is easy to feel overwhelmed. And so it's nice to know that there are lots of things to do. You know, um, FN is in a really great area of Arizona because it's about a two-hour drive from lots of really fantastic destinations, like Sedona. There's some excellent hiking in Sedona. There's actually a few lakes in the area, which I didn't even know about until about a year ago. Um, there's tons of hiking right here in the valley and a lot of really good outdoor activities, if that's something that you like to do. Um, for me personally, my class at SCNM has kind of become like a family to me. Um, and so we'll do family dinners, and we do game nights, and we go camping. Um, we specifically go camping up in Sedona to kind of get away from the city and get out in nature. And we just make sure that we take time to hang out and just kick back and not think about school. And so that is really important. And that is really what my life looks like at SCNM at this point in time. Thanks so much, Alex, for that great perspective. And now we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Bishop to let us know what her perspective is like as a practicing MD. So I'm sure she can relate to uh, many of the things that you uh, that you shared, Alex, from her time at SCNM. Um, and so now uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bishop to let us know what uh, what life is like for you as a practicing doc. Dr. Bishop? Okay. So I am Dr. Bishop, and I graduated in July of 2011. And unfortunately, I'm at my front desk, so if you hear a phone ringing, I apologize. Um, so first of all, as a physician, my day typically begins at 8 o'clock in the morning, and um, I'm in the office at 8, and from 8 to 8.30, I kind of review my schedule, look over my day, check emails, look at incoming labs, go over pharmacy refills, um, just meet with my assistant, go over the schedule, and then research any information that I would need for cases that day. I typically see about four to five patients in the morning and sometimes four to five in the afternoon for a total of about eight to 12 a day. I prefer to stay closer to eight a day. That's just where I'm comfortable for my style of practice. And I see patients uh, from newborns. I work with some of the area midwives and people that do home births, so sometimes they're less than 24 hours old. Two, um, two 85-year-olds, I believe, is my oldest patient and everyone in between. Um, teacher, um, doceri is very important to me, so I'm always working to educate both the public and patients. Okay. I spend a significant amount of time educating patients about the functioning of their bodies and their conditions, but I also am out in the community educating uh, what seems to be one of the hot topics right now is kind of the state of the health care and what the Affordable Care Act is going to mean for people, and so I do a lot with that as well. I'm also on the legislative committee for the AZNMA, which is the physician's um, state organization. So that's important to me, so lots and lots of education. I have medical students with me frequently and enjoy helping them to learn. And then, of course, to be an educator, you have to stay educated. So this involves reading a lot of journals, which I typically get apps on my phone. So, you know, at red lights or sitting watching TV at late at night, I'll, I'll kind of browse some of the journal things or keep up with what's uh, coming out in medicine. So uh, you also have to earn CMEs, which are medical continuing education. And you have to do 30 a year. I'm sorry, 10 of those have to be pharmaceutical related for doctors in Arizona. Speaker. So also along the lines of education comes public speaking. I do about one speaking engagement per week. And it's just a really good way 
to spread the word about naturopathic medicine, to again educate the public, and to allow for prospective patients to meet you before they choose to commit to you as their doc. And I think that's really important because there's a lot of misconceptions about what naturopathic doctors do and how they treat. And so I have found that when you're in front of a, a group of people and they can see you and get a feel for your energy and things like that, that they're a lot more apt to come in. And, you know, most of our patients do pay out of pocket. Um, so before they're going to spend money to come and see you, they often have to get to know you a little bit. So I think that's really important. It's been a great marketing tool, and um, you have to be good at marketing if you want a successful practice. So it kind of is a win-win for everybody. The business owner side. Um, decide early on if you're a better employee or employer, and I think a lot of people feel bad about that if they feel like maybe they are a better employee. But really be honest with yourself, and you know, some people can make great employees because being a business owner is a lot of work. And it takes a lot to run a successful practice. So know your strengths and your weaknesses. Devote time to working on your practice and not just in it. And then this one has been huge for me to hire a great support staff. So the, the places where you're weaker, you need to fill those in with people that have those strengths. Obviously, I'm going to say tie into your state and national organizations because they're committed to your success and offer much in the way of practice management. And it's just a great group of support people that have been where you are and they can help you through some of those harder times and cheer you on and give you ideas. And, you know, um, Alex kind of mentioned how it, it is a big family and that's one thing that I also love about naturopathic medicine is we all work together to ensure that everyone is successful. It's not uh, competitive typically, it's more all working together, which I like. And then I too, she, she touched on the fun. I, I kind of labeled this as a human being. Remember that you still are a person and you have to maintain balance in your work and your life. So it's really important that you take time to decompress, connect with and support your community and they will support you back. And what I mean by that is you know, we're pretty um, involved with our local schools, our elementary schools, we do events or sponsor their readathons, or we'll go and do nutrition talks for some of the sports teams, things like that. And that's been really helpful because when you support them, they support you. So I think that's great. Again, uh, join your state association and find a mentor in our profession because, as I said, they've been where you are and they know how to get you through those times. Reach out when you need to and admit that you need help and then take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. So the rewards and why I love doing what I do. Uh, our current healthcare system is in a crisis. Probably everyone has realized that by now. And I believe naturopathic medicine is the answer. When I am asked about the Affordable Care Act and how it's going to affect us, I really don't think it will. I, I believe that this medicine will kind of be the last one standing. Uh, a lot of the MDs and the DOs that I know are trying to get out of the insurance realm and go to more cash-based um, practices, and we're already there. So in some aspects, we're a little bit ahead of the game, and people are kind of fed up with the current system and the care that they're getting and the wait times and the amount of time they spend with their doc, if they even see a doc, and things like that. I'm sure you know all, all of those. So I think our medicine is in a really good place, and, and we're definitely going to be doing well regardless of what happens with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we change lives every day. I think a lot of people choose naturopathic medicine because they do want to heal the world and help everyone. And we really, really do. We get calls and thank you notes and things like that every day about the differences that we're making in people's lives. So it's very rewarding in that way. I control my income, my hours, and my future. And to me, that's very important. If my children have things at school or whatever, I can leave the office and be there. And I don't have to worry about, you know, making other arrangements because I'm my own boss. So that's always nice. And then with naturopathic medicine, there's so many opportunities. We have people from my class who have, um, they're writers, so they've written books. We have researchers. We have people that teach, speak. Uh, we have one guy who's in Puerto Rico right now. He's doing, like, motivational speaking, and he's done a movie based on diabetes and the raw diet. Uh, we have consultants, you can do direct patient care, you can blog and do web-based medicine, you can be a concierge doctor, you can do product development. We have docs involved in global health, 
uh, we have docs and politics, and so really the sky's the limit, and people definitely have want what we have to offer. So it's just a great field to be in, and I think it's the right time to for you guys to uh, make the decision to join us. Thanks so much, Dr. Bishop, for that wonderful perspective. Uh, and just a reminder to those on the call that if you have questions for either Dr. Bishop or Alex, to type those into the question box in your control panel, and we will answer as many as we can. So the first question is for you, Dr. Bishop. Can you talk a little bit about the modalities that you use in treating patients, and if you have a favorite modality? Sure. We, at our office, we use every single modality that we were trained in. So we have constitutional hydrotherapy, which is a really old, uh, from like the late 1800s, and it's a very simple way of treating. It's using hot and cold water placed over the chest and back in specific ways. We have kind of modernized it now with the sine wave, but um, very, very effective, and it treats things that typically the MDs and the DOs give up on, like chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, I've had some congestive heart patients, uh, heart failure patients respond really well, uh, MS, and, and what it does is it puts people into a parasympathetic state where healing can occur. So that's one that we use uh, quite frequently just because it's simple and it works really well. Um, we do IV therapy, which I love. We have some patients who claim to be addicted to IVs now, so they're in frequently. And that's vitamins, and it just gives people a boost of energy and helps with immune function and things like that. We do acupuncture, homeopathy, nutrition. I do uh, physical spinal manipulation, similar to chiropractic, but I use the activator. I was trained by, with the activator. Um, we do minor surgery, which is removing toenails, moles, you know, things like that. So I'm trying to think of what else I missed. That may be it. I don't really have a favorite because it's it's just um, it's great because you never run out of options. Some people respond really well to homeopathy, and some don't respond at all. And what's nice is you don't really ever have to say to a patient, "We don't have anything else to offer you," because there's always something else to do. Okay, thank you for that. That's great. Um, there's also a question um, about um, how you manage to start up your own business after getting out of medical school. Did you immediately go to, to having your own practice or did you work with other docs during the transition time? No, I did um, home visits while our office was being built and it was a classmate of mine and myself that started this practice and we found the space. It was just concrete and studs and we were able to design it and, and build it exactly the way we wanted it from pretty much day one. We did home visits up until it was ready to go. Okay, great, thank you. Um, question for Alex. Alex, what are some of the resources that SCNM offers that you have found to be helpful with your courses or your time here at, at the school? Um, well, there are lots of resources that SCNM offers. Um, one of them would be, here it's called the DDC, and basically what it is is tutoring. Um, so it's specifically really helpful with the basic science courses and trying to figure out, you know, what exactly to study and kind of where to focus your energy. I've heard people kind of equate it to trying to drink from a fire hose, and so the tutoring can definitely help you kind of narrow down what you should be focusing on at that point. Um, other than that, I think that the, the greatest resource that we have here, uh, for me currently at least, would be the student body. You know, the student body is super helpful, and I don't, I can't think of any time when I've had a question for somebody or I haven't been able to figure something out that someone hasn't been able to kind of help me do that, you know, whether it's on like patient write-up and you don't understand something about a lab or like how to read a lab or something like that, you know, the student body is really great about that, and so are all of the physicians. So I think those, that would be your greatest resource for really soaking up the knowledge. Okay, great, thank you. Alex, another question for you. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that you found SCNM to be the best fit for you, and I think this really varies from student to student, but can you elaborate on what that meant for you? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, SCNM was the best, what I felt to be the best fit because I felt that 
um, the student body was going to give me that support that I needed. So specifically, when I came for my interview, I went for um, what they call like a pre-interview dinner with a couple students um, and the rest of the people that were interviewing that, that day. And during the questions, I just really got the feeling that the student body is one where we kind of all help each other out, which I've said a couple times. And that's why the school was best for me, because I know that I personally am the kind of person who needs that support, and I thrive in an environment that gives me that. And so that's why I felt that way. Great. Thank you. Dr. Bishop, this question is for you. There are questions about salary and recognizing that there's probably you know, variations um, across the country and variations between those doctors that choose to go out on their own um, versus those that might work in another practice. Can you share some insight into um, salaries for, for, uh, for docs and maybe how long it takes for one to get to a salary that they're comfortable with? Um, I am not sure, you know, across the country what the different docs make. I do know that, you know, it's entirely up to, to us. Uh, I have seen, you know, new grads getting hired at uh, probably 80000 to like one twenty or some of the, the ones that have come across that I've seen recently. Um, when you're self-employed, you know, you, you can make what you want, which is great. Um, I also will say that when I graduated and I did our the exit interview, I did ask our um, financial aid person how many people were defaulting on loans, and she said in eight years they hadn't had anyone default on a, a student loan. So, you know, we obviously make enough to support the huge loans. It feels like huge loans you come out with, but but it works. And um, I would say if you're going to start your own practice, you know, obviously give it about three years to really. Uh, build and be where you want to be, but but uh, you can do so much with this degree that I don't think income should really be a problem. Great, thank you so much, um, Dr. Bishop. Can you tell the um, the uh, our listeners what NMD stands for versus MD? Sure. NMD is naturopathic medical doctor, and that designation, I believe, can only be used in Arizona. We can take naturopathic doctor or NMD. So um, it's just whether or not you want the medical doctor part or not. So some of our naturopathic doctors prefer not to be affiliated with medical, um, and some do. So it's just a, a decision you make. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's also a question. You had mentioned um, continuing education credits being about 30 hours a year. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, we have to do 30, of, uh, 30 hours per year, 10 of which have to be pharmaceutical related. And typically, AZNMA, our physician uh, state association, will put on two conferences a year where you can go and get almost all of your CMEs for the year in one weekend conference. It's a two-day conference. So plenty of opportunities. A lot of the nutraceutical companies will offer uh, half-day weekend courses where you can get, you know, eight to ten CMEs. Uh, lots and lots of different ways to get the CMEs. Great. Thank you. A um, couple questions for Alex. Alex, do you feel like you get support from your professors with your coursework? Um, I do feel like you get support from your professors with your coursework. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily an easy degree, but I feel like in general everyone's here to kind of make you succeed and the professors are here for that as well. Great. Um, Alex, and another question for you. Um, somebody wants to know how you plan to practice after you graduate, if you've given that some thought, whether you'll be a clinician or a speaker or a researcher. I have given that a lot of thought. Um, part of our program actually has a business course associated with it, and right now I am in the process of kind of creating my business plan and trying to think um, where I want to go and things like that. You know, I know that I one day would like to own my own clinic. Um, whether that's right when I'm done graduating, I'm not sure. It really depends on kind of what opportunities come my way. My long-term goal is to own my own clinic, and I'd actually like to own a clinic that has some other um, healthcare professionals in it. So that would be my main goal. Great. Thanks, Alex. 
Uh, Dr. Bishop, a question for you. You had mentioned that one of your classmates was from Puerto Rico, and we have someone from Puerto Rico on the line, and he would love to just kind of research him. Are you, do you remember his name? Is that something you're willing to share? Sure. He's, I don't think he's from Puerto Rico. He's just there right now doing a workshop. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. But we are licensed in the Virgin Islands and uh, Puerto Rico, so it's a great place to practice. If you would like to look him up, it's Dr. Kurt Tyson. Dr. Kurt Tyson, wonderful. Kurt. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. All right, our next question is um, for Alex. Alex, can you talk a little bit about clinic shifts? Are they all on-site or off-site or both? Can you elaborate on the different types of clinic opportunities for students? Um, so clinic shifts are a mixture of on-site and off-site. The so school has a variety of different affiliations with whether it be with um, local elementary schools or like the local hospital at an elementary school like the one that I'm in this quarter. Um, there's also a bunch of other low-income community clinics that serve different populations. Um, so it just depends on what clinic shifts you are assigned in that quarter. It depends on how many you have off-site and on-site. Um, in terms of what, what a clinic shift looks like, it's more or less you're just in a group of people, depending on how busy the shift is, depends on how many students are on the shift with you. And if you're not seeing patients, which isn't all that often, the doctor will be teaching you and going through things, and you're using patients in the setting of the classroom to kind of really learn what you've been learning all along and really solidify it. So it's a group effort in treating patients. Great. Thanks, Alex. Um, there's also a question for either of you. If either of you chose to do the dual degree program with acupuncture medicine, and is that necessary to be licensed in acupuncture? And let me just start off by saying that if you choose to practice in Arizona, uh, you, are, you have all the credentials that you need to practice acupuncture with your degree from SCNM. So some students will choose to do that if they want to do acupuncture and plan to practice out of state. So my sense is that Dr. Bishop didn't choose to do that since she's practicing here in the state, but Dr. Bishop, I'll let you confirm or deny that, and then I'll let Alex speak to, um, to her scenario. And you're exactly right. I did not do any additional training because I felt we had enough training to do what I need to do in my practice here. Great. Thank you. And do you do a lot of acupuncture in your practice? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Alex? Um, I also have not chosen to do the dual degree. Um, where I'm from in Canada, we are also licensed to do acupuncture with um, my ND degree, so I don't actually need the extra training. And probably the only place I'd end up in the States would be Arizona because the scope is so wonderful. Um, in terms of doing a dual degree, I do think that it's very useful if you plan on practicing elsewhere and you think that acupuncture is one of the modalities that you would like to use. And to be honest, it's one of the things that I wish I knew about earlier. So it's good to kind of research it early and get the information so that you can really figure out if that's something that you'd want to do. Great, thanks. And along those lines, Dr. Bishop, I will field this one to you. Are there different practice requirements from state to state? For example, if you get your degree in Arizona but choose to practice in Ohio, can you talk a little bit maybe about scope of practice? Well, Ohio isn't licensed yet, so it's very different um, in what you're allowed to do in Ohio. I do have patients in Ohio because I'm from there, so I, I treat them more on a consulting basis and I just make it very clear up front that I cannot be their physician and I cannot call in scripts or anything like that for them, but I consult with them and can suggest supplements, but you, you have to be careful with what you, you know, say or do here. Arizona has a great scope um, here, so that's why I chose to stay here, plus the weather. <laughs> that weather, it really does become... An important consideration. Yeah, it's, we, it's very nice here right now. Definitely enjoying it. Um, Dr. Bishop, I don't know if you can speak to this, but this question is directed at you, but maybe you can take a cut at it. 
what's the difference between an ND training and or doing you know a year or a two year fellowship in alternative medicine which might be available for MDs? I don't know if you would feel that you are uh, have enough information to speak on that, but the question was directed at you. I do not have enough information really to to speak on that. I will say, however, that. Um, in some of the integrative MDs and DOs that I do know and work with, uh, I think the difference comes down to our philosophy. When you take four years of a medical school that you're, the philosophy is kind of ingrained in you, um, it makes a big difference than just trying to learn holistic techniques, if that makes sense. And I've, when I've been asked this before, it's kind of like I can um, learn to speak Italian and maybe dress Italian and wear Italian clothes, but if I'm not Italian, I'm never going to be Italian type of thing, so if that makes sense. So I think it comes down to the philosophy because it's really ingrained in us early on and it's kind of how you grow up in your culture and so you think differently than the holistic MDs, DOs typically do. Now, of course, that's not every all of them because I know some that are you know, fabulous and totally get it, but it's it's a, um, what do I want to say, kind of like a paradigm shift or a, a, a mental, um, allopaths and osteopaths are trained very linear to think, you know, if this, then this. If you have a sore throat, you get amoxicillin type of thing where we look at things completely different. So it's somewhat of a jump for them to go to, to learn the way that we do when they haven't kind of grown up in the philosophy, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I like that Italian analogy. I have not heard it described quite that way, but, but I like that. I might have to steal that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, Dr. Bishop, do you carry malpractice insurance like um, uh, an allopath would? We do carry malpractice insurance. Our um, liability is not nearly as high. Lots of different theories about why we don't have as much. Um, we just don't get sued as, as frequently or as often, and so we don't need the deduct or the higher rates, that, and we don't pay nearly as much as what they pay. Probably because we do things a lot less invasively. You know, we don't do surgeries, um, except for minor surgery, and we really don't prescribe the way that MDs and DOs do. A lot of the time, you know, it comes into to play with that, and we really establish. Uh, relationships with our patients and so we just don't seem to get sued as often but we do still have to have medical liability malpractice insurance sorry great thank you um, and then this next question I'll direct at both of you um, how are you able to manage um, Dr. Bishop, as a practicing doc, and then Alex as a student, you know, to ma to manage uh, your married life and your uh, and and your children and all sort of the demands that come with that, and the demands that come with having a practice, and then Alex the demands of being a student. Dr. Bishop, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, you know, it just depends on the day. Someday I get a lot of family time and someday I get a lot of Keystone business time. You know, it just depends on what's going on. And I, I'm trying to get better about managing that a little bit more fully. But like I said before, you know, my son graduated or had his eighth grade promotion and it was in the morning. And so I just didn't schedule patients that day so that I could be there with him. And so the flexibility of that is is really nice. Or if, you know, one of my children gets sick at school or something, I can leave and go and get them. So in that regard, it's nice. It, it does take a bit of getting used to, though, and balancing out. And luckily, my husband and my children are very supportive. So it works. Wonderful. And Alex, I know you don't have any children, but many of your classmates do and are in either relationships or are married. Talk to us about that balance. OK, so um, like Dr. Bishop mentioned, I think what's important is making sure that you get the people in your life on board so that they are supporting you. Um, during medical school, you know, sometimes it's easier, to, it's easier to have balance than other times, and it's something that I think we're all kind of striving towards. So I think that really what's important is understanding that you have to take time for you and you have to take time for your family, and realizing that if all you do is study and do school all the time, you are going to burn out, and then you're not going to be able to help people the way that you really want to help people. Um, but I do think that it's really important to 
try and find that balance early. And I've been told by a lot of doctors that school is like the time when you should be practicing this because when you get out into practice is when you really need to have that. And some doctors leave with that mentality that they just need to kind of throw everything into it all the time and then don't ever get that, that sense of balance that they need. Thank you. Um, Alex, another question for you. Are there a wide range of, um, of ages in the program? Absolutely. Um, to be honest with you, in our class, I don't know what our median age is, but I'm one of the youngest people in my class. And when I started here, I was 22. I think there was only two people younger than me, and they were both 21. And then there are other people in our class that are in like their 50s. And some that I want to say are almost 60 at this point. Like there is a huge variety of, of ages and people at different stages in their life. So there's people who are single, people who are in relationships, people who are married and have kids, you know. So there's, there's definitely a variety. Thanks. And just to elaborate on that, the average age of our um, of incoming class last fall was about 29 or 30. So that gives you a sense. I think you know there's definitely those students like Alex that come straight from undergrad, but we also have a lot of students that are pursuing this as a second or a third career even, um, and a lot of different life circumstances, as Alex had mentioned. So a question for either of uh, either Dr. Bishop or Alex: What are your thoughts and opinions on residencies? I really wish that we all had residencies. Uh, there's we definitely have them. They're just not. There's not enough right now due to funding, but um, you know I think that it would really be beneficial. However, I think we're extremely well trained. I did not do a residency, and um, I've had no issues as far as practicing. Or I, I think we're better trained than sometimes even we think we are. When when cases come in, you know we really do know our stuff. So um, it would be nice to have them, but. At this point, I feel like I have plenty of training to get me what I need. At this point, I am considering a residency. It would be one of my options for that immediate year after school. Um, I think that they are really good opportunities, and I also wish that there was more opportunity, and hopefully in the future that will happen. Um, that being said, I do feel like, like Dr. Bishop said, I think we're better trained than we think we are. I feel like everybody gets this sense where, especially in the, in the position I'm in now, where you're a year from graduating and it's scary, but looking at the things that I do know and even on shift, some of the things that I, I can just pull kind of out of my brain, you know, I, I do realize that I am getting a really good education and I'm getting good training, so. Thanks, Alex. Um, the next question is, are there MD, DO, or DC students in the program? And I'll take that first, and then um, if either of you have perspective, um, either currently or from Dr. Bishop, when you're in the program, absolutely. We, um, you know, particularly DC students, we always have those individuals that, um, or even pharmacy, but those individuals that are already in the healthcare field that they decide that they want to do more and want to have um, greater uh, scope of practice. So that is very common. Um, I know in the last intake we had a couple uh, students that had already earned their MD degree and again had decided that, that, that they weren't really prepared to practice the medicine that they thought they were going to be prepared to practice. So they wanted to pursue additional training. And we also do get those students that will start an MD or DO program and then decide you know, either their first year into it or even their second year into it that, again, they're not being trained um, in the way that they thought they would be trained to practice medicine and then make the switch to MD. But I don't know, Alex or Dr. Bishop, if either of you um, have or had had classmates that might fall in any of those categories that you might want to add some perspective. Um, I mean, I definitely, I don't, I don't think I have anyone in my specific class that falls into those categories. I know we have a lot of people that, like Eve said, were in kind of more the pharmaceutical world um, before this. And, but I do think that there are a lot of people that make the switch um, and come in with other degrees. And, you know, I do feel like all the degrees that you have are going to be beneficial for you. And... So by, by coming in with like a chiropractic degree, it's not like 
you're not going to use that. You are. You're just going to build on it more, which is great. And I think that my class, we started with, I want to say three that had done, had started in MD school and decided to switch. We had one anesthesiologist who had nerve damage to his hand and could not uh, practice as an anesthesiologist. So he was, he had started our program and um, quite a few chiropractors, but they all went fast track. So, um, so yeah, that was nice for them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Dr. Bishop. And sort of along the same lines, Dr. Bishop, this question is for you. Did you have another career before getting your degree? Is, so is this a second career for you? Yes, we owned a flooring company in Ohio, my husband and I did. And, um, you know, I've done lots of other business type things. I've always been in business even though I hate it. Um, <laughs> and I've, I really wanted to be a doctor since I was two years old. So finally made it. But yes, this was a second career. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Bishop, maybe another question for you. So for those graduates that are financially unable to start their own practice immediately after graduation, what are some of their best options right out of school? Well, I would always encourage people to team up with somebody, you know, and start a practice or go in with other people. It's really hard to go it alone. We have a person practicing in Idaho right now and you know we Skype in with her and, and do things like that to keep her connected but try to, to go into some sort of team practice. Um, a lot of the docs will allow you to maybe not pay rent but do a fee split or something like that. So I would say market early so that you have patients that can support you in, in that if that makes sense. Great. And Alex, I know that you are taking business courses now as part of the curriculum. Any other additional perspective that you would add? Um, not really. I think that there are a lot of options. You know, what I'm learning through the program is that people who come out doing entirely different things from one another depending on kind of what they gravitate towards. So. There are options to go into practice with people, like Dr. Bishop had said, or to go and, you know, work in somebody else's practice, whether that's um, under them as an associate, so you're making the money and then just giving them a portion of it, or whether you're actually going to be an employee, there are lots of different options. And then there are a lot of people that go and teach as well, um, kind of as a side career when they're starting out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I mentioned, I know that Alex is taking business courses as part of the curriculum. I don't know that those were um, mandatory when Dr. Bishop was in school, but we recognize the importance in preparing students for starting up that, that practice once you graduate. So we do have mandatory courses that are part of the curriculum that help you start thinking like a business owner while you're still in school. And I know that that's something that our career director always talks about, that you it's never too early to start thinking about it. And in fact, it's critical and imperative that you start thinking about it um, as you're still going through the program. So, uh, Dr. Bishop, maybe you can run with this one. Would it be very difficult to start up in a non-licensed state? Um, uh, maybe I'll start by saying, you know, I think it will depend on the state, but we often hear that our alum that are in unlicensed state do very, very well, um, particularly because their services are rare and really desired by the public in that state. Would you add anything to that, Dr. Bishop? I would agree. We do. I have classmates practicing all over, and they do very well. And I would also encourage you. I know you guys probably think she, that I'm harping on this, but get involved with whichever state organization you plan to practice in. Even if they're on license, we still have associations there typically, and um, start working with your state associations to get the licensure. The licensing um, protects the public. It also protects us a little more and allows us to do more things because in an unlicensed state, if you're not recognized as a physician, you may, some states you can't technically touch a patient. You know, it's kind of hard to do a physical exam without touching people. But talk to people um, that are practicing there because they do well and they figured it out and made it work. But also try to get involved with those state associations and do what you can early on to help um, help kind of advance our medicine in those areas. 
Okay, great. Thank you. And just a couple final questions. Alex, what is a, one piece of advice that you have to aspiring docs and to those students that will be starting school in the fall? One piece of advice I would say would be to maintain balance and realize that <clears throat> although it's important to make sure that you're learning the information and it's important to make sure that you're doing well, it's also important to make sure that you are taking care of yourself and not allowing yourself to kind of burn out. I also wanted to say, now that I'm out of school, for the people that are getting ready to start, cherish those four years. Um, there will definitely be days where you think, man, I just want to be back there in the little bubble with everybody that gets it and supports you. And, you know, it's, it's really a great, um, just a great journey to your career and so cherish those four years. I know it seems sometimes when you're in the middle of it like you're not it's never ending and but it it's uh, it's all good. And then as far as um, the public speaking either elementary schools get involved at churches uh, whatever you know if you have children and your kids are in school see if you can do speaking at, at community centers just wherever people are. I've even had some of the moms that were interested in homeopathy I've done in home homeopathy workshops and then you know take remedies and look, make up little kits to sell so that you make some money off of those. Uh, try to be strategic in where you're speaking and try to make some some money off of that and you know you got to have multiple re streams of revenue and so whatever you can do to, to do that I think is beneficial. Great, thank you. And then just one final question. We do have um, a prospective applicant who is having a hard time getting letters of recommendation from her mentors. And she wonders if either of you have advice about other, you know, other folks that she can ask to, to, to write a letter on her behalf for the profession. I am asked all the time to write letters of recommendation. And what I started doing is having the students write um, the bulk of the letter. And then I just did an intro and kind of a, a sign it and type of thing because it just gets overwhelming when you're asked all the time and I had to start saying no. And so what I've done is if the student writes the letter and emails it to me and then I can tweak it, sign it, and send it off to them, it makes my job and life a lot easier. Plus, it's hard for me to remember which students did which events. You know, I just had did one two days ago where she had studied in Europe and done all these things. Well, I can't remember what all the accolades are. So if you write the letter, I know it seems weird, but it makes the job of the position a lot easier. I think that's great advice. Thanks, Dr. Bishop. Um, for me, I mean, I don't think, I think that it's great to get letters of recommendation from your mentors, but sometimes you need to kind of look outside the box and see who else you can get. You know, when I applied to school, one of my um, best letters of re recommendation came from my old boss because he loved me and he saw my, like, passion and drive, you know, and it wasn't necessarily a drive for naturopathic medicine that he saw because I worked at the bank, but it was just the drive that I have in general. And so I think that there are people who can speak to your character and speak to your perseverance um, to make it through without necessarily having to speak to the medical aspect of it. You know, I think that there are a variety of letters of recommendation that you can find as long as you really, really want to find them. Also great advice. Thank you so much, Alex. Well, this um, we're at the end of our time here, but I can't thank Alex and Dr. Bishop enough for your great insight and for your time this afternoon. Um, thank you so much for, um, for spending your afternoon with us and for providing such wonderful information. Um, if we did not answer any, if we didn't answer all of your questions, you can feel free to email me um, at the conclusion of um, the webinar and we'll get those questions answered. So with that, let me again thank Dr. Bishop and Alex for their participation this afternoon. Let me thank all of you for, um, for listening in. And with that, we will conclude this webinar, but please let us know how we can help you on your journey. Thanks so much and have a wonderful afternoon.